it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Doug White today in the first uh, colloquium of the year. We have uh, next uh, Thursday, we don't have a colloquium, but for the rest of the quarter, we have a full schedule, the rest of it. We also have on Fridays at noon, we have the IBS lunch, informal kind of presentations. And if you all, your name is not on the waiting list, you can still put it on the email list, you can still put it on, uh, send it to Janet. So Doug uh, received his PhD from uh, the University of Minnesota and then came to UCI in the 70s, late 70s. And he uh, has contributed to research on uh, mathematics of social networks and the, and the revolution and the dynamics. He has done work, applied work in anthropology, of course, as, uh, as an anthropologist. He has to do also work on specific, uh, uh, he has worked on American and uh, Mexican Indian groups, or to also Austrian farmers <laughs> and other sort of applications. And he has um, been affiliated with the uh, Santa Fe Institute, with uh, different institutes and universities in uh, Europe and elsewhere. He has received the Alexander von Humboldt Award for uh, Senior Scientist and other awards. And today he will, you have the title there. And, uh, well. and I have what they call the clave in Spanish. I hope Portuguese. <laughs> Maybe you could hand me. I have a few yeah, sure. more of these. Um, the reason is I thought, well, my, I was writing up the summary to this PowerPoint. It got so complex that I couldn't put it into slides. So I decided to give you a roadmap. I only have about 33 slides anyway, but they're all very dense. And so at least you'll know where we're going and what the argument is of this talk because I think the topic is extremely important. It's much debated. What kind of a species are we? Uh, did humans have a uh, cooperative beginning early on? Uh, or one that was divisive? And, you know, the, my interest in this was uh, in the uh, issue of Scientific American a couple times ago. Uh, Martin Novak um, was going through uh, simulation models, game theory, of course. His view is that humans have always been potentially um, defectors. And uh, this doesn't jibe with the uh, ethno ethnographic or archaeological evidence. Now, I want to point out that among the um, things that we have been doing here in our SFI uh, causality group includes uh, some of our graduate students, three of them in fact. Uh, Tolga just got back from a visa to go to one of the meetings of the French um, project on the simulation of uh, kinship systems, SAMPA, which was started here at Irvine uh, thanks to contacts uh, on the Alexander von Humboldt because they, the French would admire these uh, prestigious awards. So. I got invited for a couple of years to be a visiting scholar after Germany in France, and I asked them, all the stuff you reviewed is in the interest of mathematical anthropology, which is fairly um, uncommon, but when I'm studying these different cultures, not my first studies, uh, so I was trained by a guy who um, is now was the dean in Stanford uh, in anthropology, who was my undergraduate teacher in field methods. So I went out and worked with Ojibwa urban Indians and then went to, and this is uh, as an undergraduate, it's our sem seminars, because I always tried to do seminars as an undergraduate. I had a seminar in anthropological field theory, went out, got the best instruction imaginable, then went in the summer, worked with Ojibwa Indians, northern Minnesota, then as the uh, um, senior. I put my traveling uh, scholar money together. Uh, I later had a grant of that name and went to Mexico and did uh, undergraduate credit for field work for six months in Mexico because I knew Spanish. And uh, on and on like that we studied 
uh, fisherman because I was adopted by the anthropology department. So I had a lot of anthropology early. And then as a graduate student, I wanted to do the mathematics of social organization, cooperation, uh, exchange, you know, all those great topics that you get in anthropology, but usually end up in ethnography. So I'm going to show you a book that we worked on this summer. This guy is the foremost uh, archaeologist in American archaeology. He died about 10 years ago, Louis Binford. And he spent 35 years of his life not only doing the archaeology of uh, foragers, but reading every forager monograph and collecting a uh, systematic data set, which is what I do, um, on uh, climate, environment, built a world uh, environmental database, read all these 399 ethnographies, decided 339 of them were worth saving, coded that data, and I did a coding data uh, study uh, for my PhD on 90 societies and then was hired by the other guy who does this kind of uh, coded ethnography to study systems with comparative data. I did a uh, not only the thesis using North American Indians as my example, but was hired by Murdoch who's the other guy who coded tons of data. So today I'm going to combine some of Murdoch's data that I worked on soon after I was hired by him at Pittsburgh and we did the cross-cultural sample and built a lot of uh, comparative databases. But now, um, a lot of this uh, work that I'm going to talk about today on kinship um, comes from combining Murdoch's data that I kind of acquired as a colleague of his with uh, the data in this book. So this book has vast tables, precise calibration of uh, social organization, demographic, the whole works. Nobody could really use this because nobody had a graduate student who you know, responded to the proofs um, messed up the whole index and you can't find anything in the book. So we had a part of our SFI project which has been building systematic uh, databases for historical dynamics and complex systems in terms of human uh, societies and economics and so forth. We put together uh, with Binford's wife, who was, became an anthropology professor herself and was his graduate student and was <laughs> um, his, his uh, computer coder for building the environmental database. So we put all this stuff together for the first time in uh, our SFI meeting in uh, April. and. Uh, Toga Ostan and Giorgio uh, Gosti, who Giorgio is sick <laughs> uh, at the moment, and uh, I don't know about Giorgio. But uh, I then started to address this problem of, well, what do we really know about um, the origin and the nature of competition and cooperation in early societies? Now, I will make the argument, and you'll see in the little handout, uh, that there is quite a bit of comparability between the foragers that have been documented in the last three centuries, either by priests or historians or trappers or uh, conquistador or, you know, writers or sagun, uh, or other people, and more contemporary ethnographies um, that is comparable to um, early forager populations. And I'll make that argument in the middle of this talk using data from not only Binford's archaeology and his ethnography of foragers, but his reading of these intensively coded cases as well uh, for 339 forager societies. So this is documentation that is as good as it gets and is as reliable as it gets. And I compare this to the uh, kinds of simulations of the development of human co uh, cooperation that Martin Novak has done and compiled from other people. So these are the things we'll see. Now we, having all this systematic data and having taught these and having produced uh, a couple of generations of graduate students, some of whom are in the second tier of 
writing new software to do causal analysis with comparative data, which uses uh, GIS and spatial autocorrelation controls and uses Bayesian uh, factors to do not just uh, studies of regression and correlation and so forth, but actual um, Bayesian kinds of uh, second level instead of significance tests and regression coefficients. You have type two error, how, you know, what variables actually uh, compete best for uh, that of the significance tests for type two errors uh, in the model itself. In other words, you're fitting the model instead of fitting the data against a significance test. And we now have, um, we're in the final stage of putting a lot of this new software that's been developed by one of our students here, Malcolm Dow, as my student 20 years ago is now retired, um, and uh, spatial um, autocorrelation specialist in econometrics, uh, Tony F. We put a lot of this software that we started using here in classes uh, into a social science gateway on a supercomputer. So we not only do uh, network analysis of extremely large networks where we're working with very hard problems, which I'll show you in a minute what a hard problem is like. Um, but um, we're also uh, developing um, network models of the primary data itself, not simulations, and not contemporary data that you know you can get on the internet, but rather uh, data about the social structure, kinship structure of actual human you know, societies. For example, we have done uh, Florence, individual by individual, marriage by marriage, family by family, from 1200 to 1500 with uh, 100,000 people. That's not a complete sample, but it's everything that was in the Florentine archives and completely transformed with network analysis our understanding of the Florentine history, um, the role of women in that history, the role of family alliances, and the role of one of the key new network measures, which is the measure of structural cohesion, which operates in Florentine families to predict the families that are successful, that expand, that become wealthier. So if you don't want to become wealthy, you can study what makes you become wealthy. Not the first is certainly not my interest. So um, Kint Sources is uh, an online source for what is now, what started as a germ here. Uh, in Europe, working with the Germans and the French and so forth, of course, the French would be interested in kinship because of Levi Strauss. There is now an archive of all the uh, kinship data sets, 100,000 Florentines, uh, other big cities, others waiting to be done, a lot of classical anthropological society. And this Kin Sources project, which you can find on the net, you can download and analyze these 80, 85 cases and then apply the kind of thinking that's being done here in this paper. This is the outline, uh, trying to understand uh, not the descriptive and historical data, but what are the mathematical concepts that allow you to see entirely new kinds of things that we have never been able to see and problems that are con uh, considered computationally to be hard problems. So. Um, I will have some slides that are just lists of, you know, the history of these various fields that I'm going to put together. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I want to get to the core ideas. Um, so I won't spend time on that list. But here, here's the one concept. This is the slide that you have to understand. So we'll spend a little bit of time on it. In 1927, Carl um, Menger, writing in German, proved a theorem that said that two properties of networks are isomorphic. And graph theorists consider this one of the four or five basic fundamental theorems and insights coming out of graph theory. So let me tell you the insight. The insight is that what goes through a network is isomorphically structured in terms of a fundamental measurement concept with how you destroy a network. 
in other words, traversal and structure are isomorphic. Process and structure are isomorphic on this dimension that combined describe the resistance of a network to destruction and the ability of that network to perform at the highest capacity. Now, if you were a computer scientist, wouldn't you like to know that? Well, no computer scientist actually developed a software program for that. Why? It was thought to be NP-hard. It was thought to be, oh, you can't do it on big networks, so forget it. Now, this is the concept. Here's your average network. Looks like a nice guy to me. Uh, maybe it's a gal, maybe there are guys and gals, who knows what's in there. But whatever the network is, I've drawn a line to illustrate what you do to destroy that network as an entity, as a single entity. I take out some number of points. What's the minimum number of points? Well, I've drawn a red line next to three points. If I remove those three points, I would disconnect the network. It wouldn't be a connected network. That's a fundamental property of networks. It's called the connectivity number. The number there is three. Now, I'll move that red line around. Uh, I could move it over here and remove two nodes, but that wouldn't disconnect the network. It would just remove a single line. So think about it for a while. Move that line over here. I'm removing these two, but there are still routes of traversal left connected for the entire remaining network. Um, move it here. Well, that looks nice, but it leaves the network connected in, in other ways. So you can see that number is a unique number. Number. But there are many different ways, potentially, to find those three nodes. All you know is that there are three. Now that three applies to every pair in the network. There is no pair of networks, of nodes in the network, that is not disconnectable by that connectivity number. So everybody is equal in this, num in this graph in terms of their connectivity. That means this is a property of the graph itself, of the group, of the whole. Well, I mean, graph theorists go wild about such a concept. Surprise, surprise, so do social scientists like me, a mathematical anthropologist who wants to make sense out of networks empirical, empirically. So now, well, okay, that's fine. Uh, that's the connectivity number. And that separates, that's a separator, it's a destroyer. Now what about the connectivity as a connector? Well, the theorem is, and this is easy to prove in one direction, and took Menger eight or nine pages in German <laughs> uh, to prove the converse. Uh, and make it a, a theorem in which there's an equivalence relation. Uh, and that is, um, well, how many ways are there to get from independent ways, independent, I should say, independent ways of getting from one node to another. So this is the gossip meter, you know. If you want truth in the world, you want to hear information coming from different sources, you put them together and you say, hey, they're discrepant, something, somebody's lying. Um, if you have a lot of independent sources and they all come in to you, you don't know how many, but that will be a property of the graph, you're thinking, hmm, they all agree. There were, you know, I know I have a big network. I got three phone calls in Austria about one woman beating up on her husband because we were visiting people who are our hosts as ethnographers. So uh, that's they all said the same thing about the wife beating the husband. So we say, okay, so we've got to assume that the wife beat the husband because we heard this through three different sources. Well, that's one of the ways in which reliability, trust, and uh, approximations, measures of truthfulness are obtained. Uh, also, transfers. Now, um, there are a couple of routes here, but they all go through the same node. So in terms of transfers, 
um, if I was dependent on just those two nodes as leading to this one, uh, I would worry about what happened in that. Now in this graph, there are at least three independent ways. There would have to be uh, quite a lot of damage done to that network for there not to be those three ways of transporting. And again, this is from any node to any other node in the network. They have at least three. Now you can have more. Um, you can um, have more than three independent routes. Um, but you know, here's one, here's two, here's three, but I could have gone this way. And you can see a lot of possibilities. So I started, um, I actually got this idea teaching in French to a French class and not being such a great French speaker. So my mind must have been befuddled. And I was trying to teach them about data we had collected on the uh, region that they, it was in, uh, in northern France, Garde, uh, Nord Pas du Calais. And uh, we had collected data from the Anwer, which is the elite uh, book of family names. And somebody had given me the data set, so I did this. Now it's just showing the network. And then I realized, um, and I was working with kinship graphs too, that um, the, the having been a student of Harari, the graph theorist, uh, at Michigan on my traveling scholarship, so I went to Michigan, Columbia, Northwestern, and Minnesota. Uh, as a kind of observer of all kinds of social science, that it should be possible to implement Harari's uh, theorem as a program. And uh, we started seeing in kinship networks too, these areas of the network that are not only dense, but they're connected by a lot of cycles. And I'll show you some of these graphs in a minute. So uh, I was on Jim Moody's um, committee. So Frank and I wrote an article with small examples showing that this was a measurement concept. And there are ways to establish that something is a measurement concept. Kind of show that, you know, that things vary, that the, it corresponds to the measure in certain ways. So uh, Jim Moody, in his thesis, uh, wrote the first program for this. And uh, the history then is that the structural cohesion, uh, which is our name for this in sociology, was still being defined as a laundry list of things. If you read the textbook on social networks, it says, oh yeah, we have all these measures of cohesion. Uh, there are these vague ones in mathematics, and then there's density, and this and that. Well, density is not a measure of cohesion. Nothing in that textbook, or any textbook up to this time, had any real definition of cohesion. They were all skating on thin ice, and saying that this and that and the other uh, were cohesion when they're not. But this is clearly a measure of cohesion. It is cohesive in the sense that a physicist says um, a mass has cohesion that is measured by a breaking point. And um, it also has connectivity. It transmits heat or is opaque to light or whatever. So this laundry list went on until 2003 uh, after uh, Harari and I had written our article. And we call it, I call it for short, strew cohesion, structural cohesion. So it's still thought to be NP hard at this time, 2003. So we started um, studying the, pre the predictive uh, ability, predictions hypothesized and whether they turned out. So this is where all this stuff on Turkish nomads, farm, farming communities in Austria, these are other people's field work and my analysis, and all of these predictors of cohesion, for example. In Austria, it's an interesting case. Um, the people in the cohesive core of the communities are, how did they get that way? Well, they married, but they also inherited, and others emigrated. So it gives you an account of not being in the group you leave, 
as you're not in the group, they found this now in marmot studies. The marmots who are cohesive by this measure tend to stay at home, or return home. Those that don't, they leave. I well, figures, you know. It's not that they're disconnected, they have low connections. So this is the medieval Florence story, the Turkish nomad story, uh, the Costa Rican story, on and on and on. The, and this is the story for American high schools. There's a hundred high schools studied the, uh, uh, what is it called? It's a study of ad, uh, adolescent health, the Ad Health Study. Uh, about $20 million was funded by the U.S. Congress when that was still in style to investigate networks and sexual trans STDs in high schools. So we took one and analyzed it and it made a perfect prediction of high school students reported how much did they like school. It co-varied with their cohesion in their friendship groups. The reviewers said, hold on, we never heard of this stuff. You know, what is this cohesion? What is this mathematics? Um, remember, my teacher was Jewish, so I will speak in Jewish accents for emphasis. <laughs> it's also in the Jewish fraternity in my, um, so forgive that. But um, the, uh, the reviewer said, uh, would you mind, we, got, we know there are 100 studies here, would you mind picking another nine at random, then we'd have an N of 10, we could see if this really works. Well, not only worked, but it knocked out every other network variable in terms of uh, predicting this outcome variable. Um, and the coefficients were identical within error bounds, uh, you know, um, for a kind of Bayesian look at how valid this model was. Now, in just recently, um, our program, Moody and mine, was uh, added to the, uh, the, the graph package by Gassardi um, a few years ago. And then, while well, we were out in Santa Fe this um, spring, a book by Mark Newman comes out and says, oh, Gassardi has now proven in the last month um, that this thing is not NP-hard. Uh, and he transforms it by making bidirected links into directed links. So you go out and come back on different routes and then all of a sudden it becomes a Ford Fulkerson algorithm, which is the flow problem, which is a very low order of complexity. And you can now analyze big networks for this property on your personal computer. So, uh, but that doesn't uh, always do the job. So we are on uh, the supercomputer now taking examples of 100,000 nodes in co-authorships or millions of nodes in the internet models and saying we can now find these uh, entities, thousands of them, that represent cohesive subgroups do that with any network and make predictions about what their implications are. Now let's go back to kinship because this is going to be for our question of human evolution beginning um, Pleistocene let's say uh, for 40,000 years ago to 10, 12,000 these are the players in human evolution. Um, question is were they cooperative or not? by virtue of their social organization. Well, you might say maybe they were cohesive, but you know, how did they get there? But to study uh, kinship generally, you have a lot of the so-called autocorrelation problem. Namely, gee, isn't it funny? My kid is your kid. You know, we're parents. So what do you do about that? And my sibling is your sibling is your sibling. If we have the same parents, there's just a lot of stuff that's called non-independent data. Namely, it takes two parents to take one kid. And that's a form of network autocorrelation. It's just there. So what do you do? Well, you do what the French do. And of course, I observed this in France, um, asking to see and meet all of their mathematical anthropologists. You can imagine how many there were. How many? <laughs> Six. <laughs> 
So I interviewed the six, and by person number three, I suddenly saw these guys have an algorithm for this. You collapse the husband and wife into one node, and then you have a network in which every node is potentially independent of an every other. So this is what we do. This is a female, edge, red, who is in this marriage, and her, um, she's in this marriage actually. These are her parents. She has a brother, he's in this marriage, he being blue, she being red, and they have two boys and a girl. But it's also perfectly possible that you could have a complete kinship network with 100,000 people and there is no cycle. It's just a tree. That's how we think, we Europeans think, of our genealogies. But if you come from a nice Jewish background, uh, like me, we've got a lot of cycles. I'm not Jewish, really. Um, but uh, the first study we did was of the Old Testament, the patriarchs and matriarchs, and they're all full of cycles. Uh, and you can see the cohesion in the network. In the network, all the good people are cohesive, and then there's that lousy guy who has uh, incest with his daughters, and he's not cohesive. Nobody will marry him or his daughter. In fact, all kinds of terrible things happen to them. So that graph carries a message about, you know, the ideology of what it takes to be moral, to be co cohesive, to be in the group, whether it's mythology or not. Even the graph tells a story. Okay, so did I explain all of that? Um, yeah, you can do biological relatedness, but um, one of the characteristics here is that the number K for a kinship network of the number of node independent paths between any two people is never greater than two. Because think about it, you've only got two parents, so no matter how many kids you have, they're just kids, right? They're just single edges. They don't connect until they intermarry. But they only, they can marry once, twice, three times, but those are not the same nodes because each time they marry a different person, they're creating a different parental node. It's not that they're different people, but they're different reproductive nodes and they have different sets of kids. So you never get the number three. For foragers, the implication if foragers don't have complex organization with all kinds of other things going on, like teacher, student, and all that jazz, um, you'll never get a cohesion level greater than two. It's a very low density cohesion. Now, it could be that um, you have father and mother and they have father and mother, and then they, we all go back to one ancestor. Well, that would give us a pairwise cohesion of maybe eight, right? So if you're highly inbred, you can have that between a pair. And there is a measure of pairwise cohesion. It often occurs between um, ancestors who had a lot of kids and kids who have a lot of common ancestors, right? But it's only between pairs. It doesn't ever generalize. That's going to be important for the study of uh, foragers, here are some of the ones that uh, Tolga Ostan is started his thesis with. And we, I picked up uh, 21 others, give us a sample of uh, 34 cases. And then the history of kinship and networks and cohesion is one which I like to put, if you're going to study this stuff, you've got to deal with autocorrelation, whatever you do. You can't correlate anything and draw conclusions. You can only control for the things that are confounding your models. You can do as much regression as you like, and you never get rid of the confounds unless you say, what space are my observations nested in, and how do the networks that affect the variables of my individuals or cases, uh, what effect do they have? So the guy who pointed that out to the evolutionary, you know, founder theorist, 
post-Darwinian Tyler, was Sir Francis Galton, the great late 19th century statistician, who said, Mr. Galton, pack up your bags, put your correlations away, and leave, because you don't have anything valid in your comparative data. And anthropologists have been the ones who have ag agonized over that until the present day, whereas the um, econometricians and the uh, geographers, spatial geography, deal with that problem every day. And we don't. Uh, sociologists, a few of them, are over the line and dealing with that problem, but that's not very common either. So here are some people who have done various things, uh, study of genealogy, rivers, the link behavior, uh, Dr. Brown, these are anthropologists. I'll deal with that. Murdoch did a lot of this coding um, without with trying to hush hush the Galton's problem, saying there isn't any problem, my cases are independent. Well, that didn't work. Levi Strauss uh, worked with an algebraist. I'm sure you know the name Levi Strauss, but the idea is isomorphic to the great um, uh, French uh, algebraic group that has a pseudonym, but that was Andre Weil's work. And he said to Levi Strauss exactly what I said about how to solve the you know, little graph of four and eliminate autocorrelation. He said, look at the types of marriage, or look at the marriages, and then look at the network, and then you get the structure. If you don't do that, pack up your bag and leave. So um, that's why when I was in France, it was a French guy who told me they had a way to do this compaction. But they, all they did is build models. They didn't ever look at data. They only looked at data so as to get the model. And then you'd say, well, how do I know this model is any good? So we started this collaboration of collecting data and then applying this transformation. And then uh, in anthropology, David Schneider came along and said, there is no kinship. All you anthropologists think this has to do with descent and biology, and it doesn't have anything to do, it's all the social construction, bye-bye. Pack up your bag and never do it again. And there was a whole decade of anthropologists being afraid to study kinship. And then today we have graph theoretic, link behavior, network cohesion by components, uh, all these people, and up to Bayesian statistics. Now here's a graph that's been collapsed in terms of um, marriages becoming points, and we've computed the cohesion in that graph. Now what makes for the yellow cohesive nodes is they have, every yellow node has at least two independent links to every other node. So that is a cohesive sub uh, subgroup, and there aren't a yellow and a pink group, they happen to all intertwine in this real network of a uh, forager society called uh, the uh, Kung Bushman. And then the blue people, well you see some, uh, some of them are kids, so they haven't had a chance to form a union, which is what makes you potentially able to reconnect with others through multi-connectivity. And some of whom, well, those people didn't have it, that's just missing data, and these generations can't go back forever, that's a limited data set, the you know, server. Yeah, now we're observed. And you can break these up. This is from Tolga's early jottings on his uh, thesis. Break them up into bands, and now you see some of those are going to be cycles, in which case they're part of a cohesive community. But the other graph will show you that it's not all pairwise, you know, splotches of cohesion here and there. They're just one big com cohesive community. So I could probably find the links, you know, like these guys over here um, um, are obviously not cohesive, but this one is. And the fact that he's cohesive, because of the earlier graph, you learn that he's part of the big cohesive community of the whole. Uh, there, there are not two sets of separate groups of Kung, there's one. And you see this more clearly if you just do a spring embedding. And if I look at this in terms of uh, centrality, these are ancestors that have some incoming nodes for their parrot, but more than two outgoing nodes. But they don't form a little clique, they're a little bit spread out in here. Um, so this is a pretty distributed um, form of 
cohesiveness. And here I'm trying to say, well, can I disconnect that? Yeah, I can disconnect this. That, that's two connected, it's not three connected, because I can disconnect it here by two. But that just, you know, I can do that in a lot of places. And um, there may be, um, when, I, when I do that, I don't increase the, when I disconnect the outliers, I don't increase the connectedness of the core property, mathematical property. So this is kind of like an invariant measure of cohesion, unless I go and get a completely different sample. Um, now, there are a lot of ways to look at networks. In this case, I have pretended and arranged my points so that I put all the males on one side and all their wives on the other side linked to other guys who are reciprocally giving their daughters back here. It's called a two-sided system. I marry your gals, you marry my gals. It happens in this case that if I do that with the, the you can't really see these are dotted lines, but if I invert male identity, which is dark lines here, with female identity, you can do that with the females too. You can arrange it to be woman-sided or man-sided husband side or wife side in terms of, oh, this lovely structure called uh, moiety by anthropologists where you marry people of the opposite side. This is a total artifact. How can I prove that? Well, are there cycles? If there were no cycles, I can take any piece of string and go side to 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 side, to side. just as long as I keep my um, you know, if I want to say, okay, there's gender, so I only want the red yarn to go to the side. Well, the blue, you wrap around here. Many times you need the other, you go red, wrap around, and you go red, wrap around. If it was just a line with red and blue links, I can make anything to a two-sided system. So how do I really tell? Well, I have to count the cycles. So the cycle theorem in graph theory is that if you take the number of edges, the dots minus the number of nodes, I'm sorry, the number of edges are the lines the, minus the number of nodes, which are the dots, and you add one, that's the number of independent cycles. So here's this concept of independence again. Well, there are only 11 of them. That's not very much. That's a property of being a small band society where you don't have many people to begin with. We'll look at an example where that's not true. If I look for errors, maybe you don't see them here, but in a better version of this slide, I can see that there are some people whose female does not marry within the group. This female I can put over there because she's not married. Can I find one? Yeah, I can actually find five of those. Five out of 11, that's 50-50, that's perfectly random. This is not a moiety system. It's not a two-sided system in terms of its organization. It's a mirage. Um, if I look at the bands, there's a lot of this two-sidedness going on within the bands. Um, okay. But there's also stuff going on that ties the bands together. This is an example of a very densely populated um, southern Indian community. In fact, in Ceylon, uh, this is the Dravidian area where they have a kinship system, which says you have to marry a cross cousin. And what that does is it says, um, Here's my line, here's your line. Um, I marry uh, a woman over here who is already connected in one of these cross X patterns. I'll show you more of these in a second. And they, how many cycles they have? They have 44 cycles and they have eight errors of people who don't follow the pattern. Is it a real pattern? Well, we discovered um, using another technique of randomizing um, marriages within generations and comparing them, that there was only a part of the generation that behaved in the side-to-side -side exchange manner, and that was the people who actually had rel relatives in common. So a lot of these people are not all that related. They don't have common grandparents or great-grandparents, but all those who were really, were. so that's telling you. They are computing, hey, am I the right side? Like, if 
I have a grandfather and you have the same grandfather through males, we can't marry. Because nobody has completed the crossing of sides twice. Oh, I could marry a man, but I can't marry a woman because she's supposed to be from the opposite side. So I can't have the same uh, links. So um, I don't know if anybody can spot the wrong marriage, but um, it's somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, here's a wrong marriage. See, she married a parallel cousin. She, she and her husband are both members of the same male, male line. That's not supposed to happen. And it only uh, happens once. And I think we figured out that everything was, as you, as you go back far enough, this rule fails to work. In other words, people are cognizing about that. People are saying, who's your great-grandfather? How are you related? Can we marry? You know, people are actually doing that. Ethnographers report that people do that before they marry. But of course, you have to have a common ancestor. If you don't, it's up for grabs. Here is back to our Kung Bushman. And this is purely, it's not a structure, it's purely an egocentric thing of what um, Here's a female ego going up here, and her sister, uh, uh, well, let's say this is a, f a female, it's a p-graph. So that's a couple, there's a wife and a husband, and so on and so forth. So these are different types of relatives, rel of kin, relative to ego. And in each case, they regard the cross relative as something distinctive, so distinctive that in fact they have a joking relation. Hey, you don't know who you are. You know, hurrah, this is my best friend because I can marry his sister. And that's a obligatory stereotyped relationship that is almost universal in forager societies. So that whole thing, the appearance of the Bushman of a two-sided thing is all a function of this cross-cousin thing where I marry a parallel cousin, my God, I'm in trouble because that's incest. Now, I mean, they're both incest, you know, you're marrying a relative, but people like to have uh, categorical systems. So now let's redo the line of, let's start again with Tyler, who had Can faulty ask, assumptions. Question, sure. So you're talking about cooperation, so far it's only kinship Right. And that's sort of as a way of uh, right. detaining cooperation? Is that the argument that... Uh, Let me get to that in a couple of slides. We have 10 minutes. By yeah, the way. okay. Yeah. Well, I only have them halfway through. Um, so there's a whole line of, uh, you know, genetic, inclusive fitness, kin selection, spatial selection, reputation, and we're up to Novak. And then we come to the question, what about cohesion? So we're going to look at network structures. So basically, we go to this book, and uh, Binford shows that um, there is a strong environmental uh, similarity uh, all over the globe to what kinds of social organizational variants people have, and particularly what kinds of um, densities they have. And um, Novak has five mechanisms in his work, in his science article. One of them is Prisoner's Dilemma, which is, uh, you know, how to cooperate in a game which has a competitive uh, outcome for, you know, minimum risk, uh, but a much better outcome for a cooperative solution. He also identified um, unpacked foragers who are foragers who are not a population density where you can't add people or move around. Beyond that, you start having to settle and pack into a den density. And a couple of other, anthropo uh, other anthropologists have said uh, it's not that foragers have been pushed to the peripheries and so they have a different environment. If we do a comparative study, their environments are essentially, if, if you forget about the fact that cities occupy move out spaces, but you look at the remainder of the um, environments, foragers are doing pretty well 
even today in terms of the richness in Iraq. So it isn't necessarily that uh, foragers have been impoverished and are therefore a different people today. And I've worked in, with foragers in northern Minnesota, and you know, the way of life is uh, probably in many ways preferable to what we have. Other than La Jolla, that's where I live. <laughs> okay, so um, what's unique about human kinship is the absence of dominance hierarchies. It's just a fact uh, based on gender. Um, and we don't have dominance hierarchies for one thing. Uh, that differs, and uh, it's not simply sharing, uh, but, um, and we'll see another component that's very important here, but we will test the hypothesis that you raise. Well, is it differences in cohesion per se that has anything to do with cooperation? Now here's an example, and this gets me into this notion of the relation between the pairwise stereotype behavior, which almost all uh, foragers use. They all have either this joking thing, which means I can marry your sister, or I can marry your brother, if you're a girl. Um, or they have what's called uh, stereotyped avoidance, which is if you're my mother-in-law, I might marry daughter. I never talk to you. I just absolutely avoid you and there's no conflict. So I can marry your daughter. See, that's what it's all about. Marrying, being able to marry. So all these decide to have one or another or both. These guys have avoidance of the sister. Well, you're not going to marry your sister. What's that about? Well, it's really avoidance of the wife's brother's wife who is a kind of a sister. I mean, if you avoid the wife's brother's wife, uh, there's a sister relationship in there. Um, you want to be careful, and I'll tell you why you want to be careful. The Tenaino are in a very, you know, they have low density, but they operate the trading system on the mouth of the Columbia River, which is in here someplace, um, which is a very rich area for trade. And they avoid their wife's brother's wife. Why? Well, because they trade the people on the trading route are your wife's brother. See, you're my trading partner. You're in my generation. I'm linked because I married your wife. We're intimate. Um, and I marry I avoid my sister because she might screw up our relationship as traders. And I also avoid your wife because if I messed with her, I'm giving uh, the Jewish version of this, okay, which is joke. Uh, but that's actually what's going on. Uh, Frank Harari was always joking during his lecture, so you have to forgive me. Um, so we have another reason for that. Uh, if I take all six of the groups in our sample of 40, this is predicted by fishing, which is correlated with trade. So. It's not just about kinship, it's about social connection. In this case, those trading circuits are key indicators of cooperation. I mean, you don't go and trade in a circle without cooperating, by definition. So this kinship connection, so now it becomes a positive connection. The avoidance is a positive connection. Um, now, this is a little bit more about that uh, and about the way I have this thing on the net, by the way, under the old complexity things for people who want to copy. But uh, all of these things make sense, and uh, then the, uh, the interpretation of all this ends up being that joking is itself a cooperative pairwise relationship. And since it often occurs within a generation, uh, people on the two sides that are not really sides, but simply back and forth, uh, lines of marriage within a generation. You have joking um, creating cooperativity directly. Now there are other kinds of cooperativity, but we have 160 cases with avoidance in our sample. Uh, well, not all of them are avoidances, but we have 160 cases in which they are a contrastive relation. We have a lot on uh, joking. And um, we use the Binford data to do cross correlations. And this is what it looks like. All 34, except for one, have joking or avoidance or both. And this tells you if you take 
density of population, remember that human ancestors in the forager stage have to evolve from low density to higher density. They have to densify. So the axis here is uh, density of the population. This is the packing threshold of 9.1 that Binford finds from all his other data where social organization changes because you now have to pack together. And um, the joking tends to be very common below the packing density, whereas the avoidances, and I put in red, tend to be on the other side of this. However, it's also, you know, if I say there's a contrast here, there's an opposite contrast here, and there's a regression for the red lines that goes that way, and a regression for the green lines, because, in other words, joking gets uh, less common. So this is a three-way interaction. And what are the what? What are the X's? The axes. Oh, the axes. Okay, so this is frequency of joking on one scale. Um, it occurs more frequently, so the graph overlaps. And the other is the frequency of avoidances, and if you kind of scale up to the same space in the graph, you get a correlation between the presence of these cooperation creating pairwise cohesion. X is the, uh, the density, X is per density per is persons per square mile. Yeah, persons per square mile. So I can uh, go into this uh, in detail. Um, and the implication in the middle, because it, of the universality of this, it's very probable that, you know, we didn't have one kind of ancestor and then split. Our ancestors. You know, the descendants of our ancestors all have this property. They have a lot of other properties too. But clearly, this is one of the mechanisms of proto uh, early forages that creates cohesion. And not just cohesion, but it doesn't necessarily cohesion, uh, create any cohesion. These pairwise things create cooperation directly. Uh, now, uh, at the bottom, I say because avoidances are a mechanism of conflict resolution, don't fight. I don't want to be the mother, you know, telling you not to marry my daughter. We don't even talk. Um, so what you do is your business. What that does is it's a conflict resolution form of cooperation. Do what you want with your generation, and uh, it affects it. it uh, it reduces the need for uh, joking relations, that way. And, uh, but avoidances uh, are not affected by whether you have, you can have a lot of joking, uh, of joking relations and have lots of avoidances too. So that avoidances are more kind of independently structured, but they're highly structured. This is a, called a lattice structure, Galois lattice. And in the top thing, are um, mother-in-law avoidance, um, father-in-law avoidance, and then, uh, those are cross-sex, and then same-sex parent-in-law avoidance. And those are replicated in this lattice in all of their variations in terms of the intersection with the uh, other forms of avoidance that I've discussed, like uh, it turns out brother sister can be avoided and uh, the uh, wife's brother's wife here is It is one of the key avoidance of the wife. That's the people who avoid wife's brother's wife. Well, the point is the structure of this is drawn by one of the uh, Burkhoff, the great mathematician of ordered sets. This is a, per this graph perfectly reproduces with zero errors the original data, because it's simply a post-set, partially ordered set of the sets of societies in one dimension and the sets of kinds of relations on the other dimension. And uh, this is something I picked up in Germany. And this was drawn for the, I did, uh, for the uh, year, 
anniversary of the event of the viruses in Pakistan and cover. But it's an amazing diagram because it's an isomorphism. Damn. There are four uh, simulations in a book. This is the book, Dirk Kepney, which just came out. Uh, this is one, and it's one a simulation that matches merger interaction perfectly and predicts the cooperation will always happen, namely a spatial cluster interaction. You get the blue nodes uh, strongly, consistently cooperating. Uh, and uh, with spatial separation, you get defection. So I go through these in the slide. And this is on the web. It's a great little thing to look at. And then you have your summary. It's on one minute. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. The what else correlates, correlates with cohesion? Like, um, if you commit a crime against someone you're close to cohesion to, is that far worse? Is my like incest far worse than? Yeah. Well, you're going to get. Did you have correlations like that? that uh, yeah. I mean, that's a good one. My favorite one is they took this measure into schools and they uh, measured, this is kind of analogous, bullying in the schools. So they had low density schools, elementary schools, they had 40 of these. And they were all low bullying, like 40 years. High density, maybe density by uh, connectivity K level five or six, bullying. So people are beating up on people they're close to because a flat two-order cohesion is uniform. And a six cohesive structure has a hierarchy. One, embedment can be a two, embedment three, four, five. So the people at the top of the cohesion structure can push other people doesn't happen among fortunes. Kinship is the only relation. It's only a two cohesive structure. In fact, I drew out that slide. These are the studies, the egalitarian classes in schools are the classes with forager level <laughs> cohesion, two cohesion, as if it was constrained by something. Although it doesn't have to be, could be just a these are friendships. These are friendships, yeah. And then the bullying is a separate measure and means of some of the results. And then they redid this. CNN, uh, what's his name? The big announcer. Anderson, yeah. Anderson commissioned a study of bullying. This is the Anderson. Yeah. Um, commissioned CNN a study of bullying in high school. And the, um, you can see the, the lines of bullying. And they didn't do our kind of analysis of this. The bullying thicker, the more cohesive the groups are. Uh, but uh, you see the same kind of thing. So yeah, you can uh, you can beat up on if you can convince others in your group that beating up on the little kids is a great thing, and the other kids in your bullying group will back you, you can get away with the crime. And then when you go to um, the uh, size of your anthropological data sets, how big are the societies? They vary from thirty to. Go to the Pleistocene, how big where? They're on the small end. I mean, there's nine people per square kilometer. It's, uh, you can know, have a little band there, more than nine, but they're going to have a territory in a square kilometer. So he has all the aerial sizes in this book. It's a great book. I mean, so I'm surprised to see, you know, that line sitting there between these two 
outlying distribution above and below with exactly the right predictions about jumping points. So this is not, I'm not saying that cohesion is necessarily a good outcome. It could be a mafiosi you know, kind of group, holy group. I'm just saying it has, uh, it has predictors. I mean, the same six level cohesive group predicts over time, that is from time T1 to time T2 for all time periods, uh, changes in the contracts between biotech companies. Uh, there are two predictors. Number one, hire some little firm that is just doing something completely original that has no cohesion. Number two, hire the predictor is hire according to them. Make the contract according to the cohesion. So those guys at the top of the biotech industry literally see, like my phone call, they can see everything happening in the top echelons because they have six or more independent lines of information. It's really many more non-independent lines. I mean, maybe that's a thousand lines of phone calls ringing through the uh, connected network. So they're using it presumably for good. I mean, sometimes I wonder about my medical products. Go uh, there. So, any, yeah. Any other questions? Well, I, I have a question about uh, the issue between the small scale, say, 30 to 500 people that you have versus the 100,000. Yeah. I mean, that, that there's a qualitative difference in terms of you know, going from 500 to where everybody would be connected you know, yeah. to some kind of kids uh, to, well, yeah. to going to essentially anonymous societies where you right. have all different groups. And yeah. So and that's where they the right. key for the issue of cooperation that we were discussing right. about. So what happens um, in, I don't know which slide it is, but one of the things I glossed over is that after you pass that uh, threshold, the packing threshold, there comes a point where kinship relations become less and less. Well, at the same time, you get more and more mechanisms for social control in those societies. And that's, I, I just made a sense to that. There is, that has to be dealt with. Yeah. So it is possible that those low density corridors were cooperative because their whole setup was through kinship, and kinship is by definition a very low order form cohesion, which is the best for a health family organization. As you go up the scale, it doesn't do the job. Well, okay, so we can, uh, we'll continue the transition yeah. of, uh, continue the discussion with uh, some wine and 